Guitar, it kind of rocks. Really, ask my kids. In the year that King Uzziah died, what does that mean? The ancient people of Israel had once had a great kingdom. It was so powerful and beautiful and complete that other kings and queens from all over the world came just to see it and to actually kneel before the great Solomon the Wise and ask him for a bit of truth to take back with them to where they came from. That was all long ago by the time that King Uzziah died. By this point, the nation had been rift in two, torn into two completely different tribes. One still clinging to the name of David, to the name of Jesse, to the promises that from that throne God would work salvation for the world. And the other, though called Israel, really under the thumb of the tribe of Ephraim. You may remember Ephraim and Manasseh were the sons of Joseph who received a double blessing a double portion from their father Jacob. And it really did play itself out. They were both twice as big as any other tribe, which made Joseph's tribe significantly large. And all of their warfare, Ephraim always went out first, for they were men well-trained for battle. They were known to be not bloodthirsty, but competent, the warriors of Israel. So Ephraim takes charge of the north. And all the other tribes rally to this most obvious of leaders. Things don't go so well. As things go on there, the north needs to diversify itself from the south. You can't have David's throne. You can't have David's God. And so they set up a golden cow. And they call it Yahweh. And they set up that old snake on a pole that Moses once used. And they call it Neshustam. And they begin to worship images of every kind. And things get bad. God begins to say to them through various prophets that if they do not repent soon, they will be swept away once and for all. The call of Isaiah is such a call. that he is raised up from among the people to speak to this northern nation particularly of their impending destruction. So that when Uzziah dies and everything descends politically into chaos, things are about to go downhill very fast. But it's in that year that he then receives this call, this marvelous and really unbelievable thing. In Bible study, we spent the last 30 minutes this morning really discussing arguing, debating the realities of what science can teach us and what scripture can teach us. And at the heart of that, I would contend, is not any particular issue, the age of the earth, whether or not evolution does or doesn't do this or that. What's at the heart of this is that we have brought into our hearts an assumption, which is that what I can see is real, And what I can't see is maybe real. So that angels and demons and such things, while I'll say, sure, I'm a Christian, I should believe in such things, I don't live practically every day as if it's true. I don't walk around fearing that I might die out of the faith and lose myself in the eternal hell. No, generally speaking, I spend most of my days trying to have my best life now trying to make all the pieces of the material world submit to me and do as I would have them do. In that, there is no place in my experience, and I would contend in your experience, for even comprehending what it must be like to have been Isaiah, a normal everyday Joe, not a priest, not a prophet, who one day gets smacked upside the head with a vision, ripped out of the place that he was. What was he doing? Drinking coffee in the morning, reading the newspaper, on a commute to work. We don't really know. But like this, he finds himself in the highest heaven. The edge of the top of whatever dimension the angels live in, where there is seated on a glorious throne, God himself. And that's the picture he paints for us. Where was he? How did he get there? Could it be true? If somebody today came up to you and said this, you would say you're insane. 
You're nuts. I had a vision. I saw God yesterday. Do you want my credit card too? I mean, you're not going to listen to this person. Why do we listen to Isaiah? Well, there's a reason from the Old Testament. When a prophet of old is given words by God, it isn't just I had a dream. It's also God said this. He said to say this to you, and here's the sign that it's going to happen. And if the sign takes place, you knew he was a true prophet. If the sign doesn't take place, you're supposed to kill him. (laughs) Because he's a false prophet. So we know that Isaiah's prophecies came to pass. He foretold a number of things that happened in his age, even before the things he told which would happen later. All that being said, what we have today is not any of those prophecies. All we have is his experience of this eternal council, this eternal throne room of God, which has a bit of a weird set of things that happen in it. We'll talk about these guys, the seraphim. There are two other places in the Bible where a similar event happens, both with what we would call prophets. Uh, The first is the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel has this happen a, well, a couple generations later. This is after lower southern Judea has also been destroyed and taken captive in Babylon. Ezekiel is in Babylon, and he's told to prophesy that they're going to be returning. But before that happens, he also gets commissioned, and he sees the throne room of God, and he sees these crazy angel creatures. He calls them cherubim, not seraphim. Are they the same? Are they different? That's sort of a debate. John the Apostle also, that was like a tongue twister, John the Apostle also went on the island of Patmos, has this magnificent vision that we have in the book of Revelation, sees the throne room of God, and he describes not cherubim or seraphim, but living creatures, he calls them. As I talk about it today, I'm going to not pick it all apart separately, I'm going to smash it all together into one big picture to try to help you get the experience again. But just so you know, I'm pulling from more than just Isaiah here. But they see the same place, this throne room of God, where the everlasting Ancient of Days sits. And that brings up its own question. How does God, who doesn't have a body, sit? Right? How does God, who dwells in inapproachable light, that no one has ever seen or can see, sit in such a way that Some guys see him. And just like that, we are cast headlong into either the scriptures being wrong or God being more complicated than we would want to give him credit for. For example, you probably are not going to assume as you read this text that the person that Isaiah saw was Jesus. You probably assumed it was the Father, right? But the Father is the God that can never be seen, can never be shown, who again dwells in the inapproachable light. John tells us in his gospel, no one has seen God, but the only God has made him known. Well, how do I reckon that? Right? Well, the only God, the Son, has made the only God, the Father, known. And the Son is the one who we engage with, who we can see. And so here we are with this pre-incarnate, non-Jesus human body, but same guy, same person, son, manifesting himself in a way that we can understand him. That angels and demons and us and the rest of creation can engage him. That'll get us a little bit to the seraphim here. The point, though, of this, though, the throne, is not whether or not it's actually a physical thing that's there forever. The real point is to demonstrate that this God who he sees is in charge. Who sits on thrones? <laughs> it reminds me, my kids made me a throne yesterday out of pillows. What did it mean? It meant I'm in charge, right? It means, it means I am the one to be lifted up and to be looked at with glory. And thank you, children. I appreciate that. <laughs> Kings sit on thrones because they wield power. And when you come into a king's presence and he's seated on the throne, do you sit down? Not if you know about kings, no. You stand or you lie down on your face. And if the king comes in and you're seated, and we even do this with the president. If the president comes in and you're seated, what do you do? You stand up. Because to be seated in the presence of others is to demonstrate that I am more powerful than you. So when Isaiah sees this high and lifted up almighty God on the throne, it is demonstrating that even though what's going on in Israel at this time 
with the north and south all divided and everybody starting to fall into idolatry and the end of it coming to, coming to pass, God is still in control of all of it. He knows exactly what's going on. Again, in Bible study, it was mentioned this morning, it sure looks like Satan's in control of the world today. Pay much attention to the news and what do you get? A lot of bad news. It does look indeed as if Christianity is weak, as if evil is on the rise, confusion and chaos are rampant. What does it mean? Is God not paying attention? Isaiah's prophecy tells us, no, he is. He knows exactly what is going on. Because this is always here, behind all things. The difference is, what is he doing? Why is he moving all things? What is he attempting to achieve? Is he trying to give you your best life now? Or is he trying to keep you in the faith until Jesus returns? And I would contend to you that's what he's trying to do. The reason he doesn't let you have everything you want because then you, would think you would, then you would think you are God and you would forget about him. So instead he gives you trial and tribulation and cross to point you back to the man on the cross who saves you from this for whom you yet wait to return from this same throne to bring that throne down and establish it by sight here on the last day. With that said, moving back into the text, verse 1 again. He sees him high and lifted up on this glorious throne, this magnificent heavenly expanse. Ezekiel tells us it's made of sapphire. There's a rainbow that's on fire around it, if you can believe such a thing. Don't miss how also, though, that language of high and lifted up is the same language that Jesus uses to describe the snake on the pole that is the foreshadow of his cross, that the Son of Man must be lifted up above the earth. Nice little tweak there. But back to the throne room where he is high and lifted up in glory. The train of his robe filled the temple. Can you imagine this? I mean, this thing's long enough. I gotta like pick it up when I go up the stairs so I don't trip. Imagine if the train literally took over the ground. And again, what did I just say a moment ago? Do you stand in the presence of a king? So glorious is the majesty of God and his robe, you can't even stand in the room at all. Because the floor is covered. The only servants that are allowed to be there must fly <laughs> to be there. They are above him, verse 2 tells us. The seraphim. Seraphim, cherubim, living ones. How do we want to describe them? They are not archangels. They are not the normal heavenly hosts that sing over Bethlehem. They clearly are of the heavenly realm. But if you painted a picture of them and put it on a Hallmark card, nobody would buy it. Isaiah is kind of nice. He doesn't tell us too much about them. He says they have six wings, two cover their eyes, because they can't look on God and his glory, two cover their feet, because their feet have no use standing before the God of all heaven and earth, and with two they fly. That's about all they say to us here in Isaiah. Ezekiel tells us, however, that they have bodies that are like molten coal. So imagine when your fire pit dies down and you get that nice flickering darkness and red and yellow that's all going on in the coal bed. That's what their whole bodies are made out of. They're like on fire all the time. And then they also have eyes, like eyeballs, everywhere, over every element of their body so that they can see in every direction at once. And then, depending on how you read John and Ezekiel, their heads are pretty weird. Either, and I, I can't tell you which one, I know what I think, but I'll give you both of them, they're both fine. Either, each of them has a different head, or each of them has four heads. I like the different head one, because the four heads is a bit weird. But, you can imagine the four heads maybe being one big head with four faces, one on each side. And we know that of these four faces, they are a ox, a eagle, a, no, I lost it. Where'd it go? Ox, eagle, lion. Thank you, Carol. Appreciate it. A lion and a man. What on earth is that about? I mean, take a step back. We're in this, you're walking around having coffee one day, and now kabam, here I am, smoke and glory, a robe everywhere, I got nowhere to stand, and there's like burning eyeball beasts with animal heads and wings and what on earth, right? What does it mean? And this is kind of the key here to this. 
to understand who these four angels are, if they are four with four heads. The number four in the Old Testament, like all major numbers or prime numbers, not prime, but major numbers in the, in the Old Testament, has a spiritual meaning. Over the course of the Old Testament, they take on symbolism. So, for example, the number seven is the number of holiness, because on the seventh day, God rested, right? The number 10 is the number of completion. The number 12 is the number of the church, because the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, you have all that kind of stuff. You can spend hours on this, okay? But number four, this is the key to the text. Number four is the number of the earth, the number of the earth, or the number of creation, and this is connected to the idea that there are four corners to the earth, which doesn't mean we're living on a box. It means that on any given space of ground, you have four major directions that you can go. North, south, east, west. The four corners of the earth. Also sometimes called the four winds. So whenever you see the four show up after this idea is spoken of as a cultural idea in Hebrews, Hebrewism, the number four now comes to reflect the earth, or the creation. So now these four animal head things on these angels should tell us, hey, this has something to do with the created order, with creation, which is the earth. And then you look at these animal heads, and they kind of make sense the way Hebrews would think about the animal kingdom. See, for us, we got our kingdoms and phylums and genuses and all this stuff. We split them all up based on DNA and all that. The Hebrew didn't care about that. They cared about basically three categories plus one. They cared about wild animals. They cared about tame animals. And they cared about birds, which are neither wild nor tame. So what do you have? You have the king of the wild animals, the lion. And you have the king of the beasts of the field that you would have tame, the ox. And you got the king of the birds, the eagle. And then you got mankind. The man standing as set apart from the animal kingdom, and yet we clearly are part of it. And these four cherubim, seraphim, living creatures are up in God's presence. Now, amazingly, in Ezekiel, they are underneath his throne, and they can't get to it. In Revelation, they're up with him again, which I think is about the segregation between all of our creation pre-Jesus and the restoration of us to God's presence in Jesus. Now, maybe that's a bit much for you this morning. But take it as this way, at least this much with this. These seraphim, cherubim, living creatures are representations of the entire living animal world in God's presence doing something. Praising him. Acknowledging him. Confessing who he is. Verse 3, they called to one another... Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth knows who God is. The only ones who don't are we poor, miserable humans who have broken away from him. The whole earth is connected to what God wants the world to be. And they are in Christ looking forward to the same hope that we are. Notice also, holy, 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 threefold holiness. Just like four is the number of the earth, three is the number of God, which connects not only to the idea of the Trinity, yeah, but also to this very notion that they are, he's so holy, he's holy cubed, right? He's exponentially holy. Now, we're pretty much out of time here. I'm going to just run through the rest of this Hitchison gospel right at the end. They sing, they shout holy, just like we're about to, by the way, in the Lord's Supper in a few moments here. And verse 4, the foundations of the thresholds shake at the voice of him who calls. So now the whole place starts shaking as well, right? And the house was filled with smoke, incense, and darkness, and it's just, it's, it's chaos, it's actually kind of scary. And so what does he do? He's scared. Isaiah says, woe is me. I am lost. He thinks he's at judgment day. He thinks he's at judgment day and he's about to be damned. I am a man of unclean lips, he said. That's one of the best ways to describe sin I can think of. That my lips are not clean. 
But even when I put pretty words on my lips, I do it for selfish reasons. Even if I never use a potty word in my entire life, I think I'm pretty good for doing so. My lips are not clean. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. When God judges the United States of America for our sins of abortion, for our sins of hyper and backward sexuality and our destruction of marriage, we Christians who are here will reap whatever judgment comes upon us, for we are part of this people of unclean lips. Corporate guilt. It's not your fault specifically. You know this. You always got mad when your teacher punished the whole class for one kid. Corporate guilt. It's real. I have unclean lips, and I'm amongst a people of unclean lips, but my eyes, he says, have seen the king, the Lord of hosts, the God of war, basically, is what that means, and he believes judgment is upon him now. But, here's the gospel in the text. Then one of the seraphim, these crazy psycho angel beasts, flew to me. <laughs> it's going to kill me, right? Flew to me. <laughs> This is not really fun sounding. Having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. So in this throne room, we know from other descriptions, there is an altar. The altar is not like this made of wood. It's for burning stuff. There's fire in it, right? It's for burning stuff to a shred. He takes a coal from God's holy altar and flies at Isaiah's face with it. What would you do? I think I'd duck. Dear heavens. He touched my mouth with it. Burning cold of the face. But what does it do? He said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Now we know that in order for sin to be atoned for, Jesus of Nazareth, the God-man, has to die. And that hadn't happened yet. But God had planned it. God had prophesied it. God had said it would come to pass. And so in this moment, by a type, by a sacrament, if you were, by something which carries the power of Jesus' cross to someone, by this burning coal, the unclean lips are purified and made clean. And more than just that, all of his guilt, all of his sin is taken away. Now, this again is the commission of Isaiah. He hears a voice. The Lord says, I got to send people to judge Israel, Israel with a prophecy they won't want to hear. Who should I send? <laughs> he goes, I'll go to seminary. Ooh, dangerous words. Send me, though. Send me. And he goes. And Isaiah ends his life sawn in half by those he was sent to preach to. We won't go into all of that now. But what I want to do is tie this throne room to this moment. The altar of God in the heavenly place, symbolizing a sacrifice that happens at a cross, where the once for all payment and atonement for sin happens, comes to Isaiah by this burning coal that hits his mouth, and by that carrying of the sacrifice of Jesus to him, makes him clean. Today, we will not have a shaking building. We will not have smoke. We will not have angels and archangels and all the company of heaven that we can see. But we will laud and magnify God, singing holy, holy, holy with angels and archangels. And then a messenger from the altar of God will take, not a coal, but bread and wine, and give you the body and blood of Jesus, the atonement of all of your sins, placed into your unclean lips to declare you clean. I'd love to go on, but let's just, let's just do that now. In the name of Jesus, amen.